All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have seven candidates running for uh, three seats on the Maricopa City Council. What we're going to do to make sure that we have the maximum opportunity for questions and interaction with each of the candidates, if you come up and ask a question, if you want it directed at a specific candidate, please indicate that. If not, once you finish your question, then I will have three candidates answer the question, giving them each a minute to answer the question. The other four candidates, if they want to say something different than what's already been said, we'll give you 30 seconds to respond to the question, adding anything. That way we don't have to go through the process of ditto or I, I agree. Um, but we do want to make sure we get everybody an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to uh, say their piece and why they might be different. So we're going to begin. Uh, we'll start at the far end with uh, Mr. Wade, and we'll give each of you an opportunity. I, are we doing 30 seconds or 60 for opening? What do we want to do on this one? All right, we'll do 60 since they're leaving the choice to me. 60 seconds for an opening statement. Well, wow, that's a lot of time. <laughs> good afternoon. Or, <clears throat> excuse me. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here all day. How many of those of you have been here since 10 o'clock this morning or 9 o'clock this morning? <laughs> all right. You guys are the champions. Uh, my name is Henry Wade. I'm currently city councilman for the city of Maricopa, and I am running for re-election uh, for the next term. I feel like uh, I have been doing a good job for you, and I hope that you will recognize that and support me in my effort for re-election. Uh, I've been a resident of Maricopa since 2008, and if you had said to me in 2008 that I would be on city council, I would have told you you were crazy. There was no way. But I found my way here. I found my way here through a varied uh, activities. I was planning, planning zoning commission for a period of time, vice chair for two years, served on many boards and commissions, currently do many boards and commissions and other activities. But I found the love for Maricopa was what drove me to continue to want to be here at, in city council. So I'm running for re-election. I'm hopeful that you will give me that opportunity. And if you have any questions, you can visit my website at teamwade2018.com or give me a call personally. I'll give you that number later. All right, thank you. Ms. Caroselli. Ms. Caroselli, I'm not in class. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Lynette Caroselli, and this is who I am. I am a mother, I am a teacher, and I am a servant leader. I've been in here in Maricopa for the last five years, and I can't think of any other place I would rather live. I'm originally from New York, by way of New Jersey, by way of Pennsylvania. Like Mr. Wade said, if you would have told me five years ago I would be in Arizona, I would have looked at you with the side eye. But I'm glad that I'm here, I followed my mom, and I don't regret it. I am running for city council because I believe I can make a positive and impactful contribution to our beautiful city. I am dedicated to service and committed to progress. I want to be committed to you. So on August 28th, vote for Lynette Caroselli because this is your city and I want to be your voice. Thank you, Ms. Page. Or Ms. Ritchie, I'm sorry. <laughs> so normally I would not take any of my time, but since we've been given a little extra, I'm going to go ahead I'm and take so, a I, moment can, to is thank... Is your mic on? I'm having a hard time hearing. Hello? There oh. we go. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take a moment. Um, normally I wouldn't do this, but I want to take a moment to thank the Maricopa Fire and the other communities who helped the family today, earlier this morning in that fire. Um, luckily, everyone made it out safely. It was very close to my home, so I'm very glad to hear that that came together. And I also feel as though it highlights something that I stand for greatly, is interdependence between communities, coming together to make sure everyone is safe, productive, and happy, and healthy. <laughs> I'm Paige Ritchie. Many of you know me because some of the people here are so young. I'm only 20. Um, I'm running for City of Maricopa City Council, and I really look forward to hearing more from you, being your representative, and helping everyone in the future as well. Interdependence, helping our community progress, and being everything that we can be. Thank you. Mr. Vitiello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being here. 
we put ourselves out, every single one of us, and it's for the city. It's for you. I stand here today to look for a job to help you people, to help the city of Maricopa grow. 27 years of international business experience. 27 years of international business experience. I feel that that will help you and help the city grow for the things that we're looking for. Economic development. Just make sure we support our fire and police, which I am the only candidate that is endorsed by both fire and police. I take that very seriously. I have eight grandchildren. All my family is here. We have two of my daughters that actually live here in Maricopa. I have five grandchildren that live in Maricopa. My mother and father, until they passed away just recently, lived here, lived with me. So I take this job very serious, and I want to help this city grow and get what you guys want, what you need, and what we want to see for our future and the future of our kids. Thank you, Rich Fidiello of Maricopa City Council. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Less taxes, 347, education, seniors, veterans. We all want the same thing. Every politician up here is going to say that, too. We all want the same thing. That's what we all want, right? Because if I came up here and I said, look, I'm going to raise taxes for all of the senior veterans that are still in school, you wouldn't vote for me, right? <laughs> How many of you have said, let's get rid of the politicians and let real people be in office? Anybody said that? We all have. I am not a politician. I've never run for office before. I am a tax-paying citizen. I am you. And that is the reason I got involved with this race. I wasn't just, I'm retired. I wasn't just sitting in my pool drinking a Mai Tai and thinking, gee, how can I screw up my retirement? I wanted to do something for the citizens, the taxpayers like myself of Maricopa. And that is why I threw my hat in the ring to run for city council. I am a right brain person. Left brain people, right brain people, you need to have both. So you think a little bit outside of the box and you work with together and you get things more accomplished. If you vote for me, my votes will all be for you, all of you. Thank you so much. Mr. Marsh. You may have heard those three words, vote for Bob. And I'm not a politician. I'm an MIT grad engineer. I'm a problem solver. I've been paid a lot of money over the years by big companies to solve big problems. At Microsoft, I got to be in charge of community development, building the community of Microsoft partners around the world who provide their services to small, medium, and large businesses. We grew that community from 30,000 people when I joined the company in 1998 to 7 million people in 2009 when I retired. Using those same programs, it's since grown to 17 million people around the world, operating in 50 different languages in all countries. And it's just been an amazing ride. Um, our little data doctors company here in Maricopa is a benefit of that program. Um, there's more information on my website, maricopavoteforbob.com. And uh, I hope I can earn your vote. Thank you. Mr. Manfredi. Hi, everybody. My name is Vince Manfredi. I'm currently your serving council member. I'm running for re-election. I look in the audience today, and I see faces of so many people I already know. And I'm kind of disappointed in that I don't see faces of people I don't know. There's not enough people in this auditorium, so what I need from all of you is I need you to get out there after today and talk to people. Ask them who they're voting for, why they're voting, and, and ask them to educate themselves on the process. What we have to do is understand that no matter what happens, the city of Maricopa is number one for everyone on this stage. 
And I think it is. I think everybody that's running loves this city. I think everybody in this room loves this city or else you wouldn't have spent eight hours here today. I got here this morning and set up a table and, and was talking to people, sitting out in the heat. I've changed t-shirts six times. I'm sweating. It's, it's ridiculous. But what we do is we do it because we have a love of our city. So we're going to talk a whole lot today, but my name is Vincent Manfredi. I'm currently your council member and I'm running for re-election. Thank you. All right, thank you. First question. Um, our first question comes from Demetrius. All right, if I could, uh, anyone asking a question, if you'd please limit your prefatory comments and get right to the question so we can maximize the questions. All right, we're going to jump right in. So, my name is Demetrius Seabrooks, and a question for the whole panel. What are the plans for, the, for funding in the upcoming budget for more pilot after-school programs in Maricopa, and how will you allocate them equally across qualified organizations? All right, thank you. Let's start with uh, Ms. Caroselli. We'll let you start, Ms. Ritchie, and then Mr. Vitiello. Sir, can you repeat the question one more time, please? All right, here we go. What are the plans? What are plans for the upcoming budget for funding more pilot after school programs in Maricopa, and how will you allocate them equally across qualified organizations? All right, so how are we funding after school programs? Thank you, Mr. Seabrooks, for your question. That's actually a part of my platform to have a city youth collaboration with our school district. It's gonna to come twofold. So we do have a governing school board where they have their own budget and then the city has their own budget. Uh, some things the city can and cannot do, there are some legalities there. Um, from my understanding, I'm going through administrative uh, education, learning to be a principal, I'm learning a lot about that right now. What I want to do is tap into some possible grant money, also do some fundraising to make that happen. I know about your program, I think it's an excellent program, and I encourage people who are into improving the quality of life of our youth, please talk to Mr. Seabrooks about that. He has a wonderful program that he wants to bring to our district, and I think it's awesome. Um, but that's what we need to do. There needs to be a collaboration between the two so that we can make those programs happen because we want our kids to stay out of trouble. They get in trouble when we don't have anything for them to do. I witness it every day. Yeah. Ms. Ritchie. I think it would be just outright false for me to say I have a plan. Those are the things that absolutely we need to collaborate with our community, with our school boards. And I, there are obviously things we need to keep separate. I know MUSD has it separated, but I believe that is my point of expertise is paperwork. <laughs> my, my previous jobs, most of them have been filing paperwork, administrative. Um, I worked for briefly a contract through the state of the Department of Economic Security. So I have done paperwork on how to qualify, how to this. So the biggest point we need to do is set the standards. What is qualifying? How do we delegate it? If there is a person, if there is three groups that are qualified for it, how do we decide which is most important? There is no way. We would have to give it to them equally, but we do want to make sure we are absolutely not limiting our students, making these priorities for them. So more than anything, I would be outright wrong for me to say I have a plan. But interdependence, reaching out to other communities, seeing how they have built those programs, how they have made their communities successful, especially for youth, is the best way that we can move forward, is looking where things go right and putting Maricopa on it. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Vitiello. Tax revenue. Money, 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 that's what we need to make. We need to make sure that not only do we bring more rooftops here, but we also need to bring more strip malls. We need to make sure that every time we have a new strip mall, we fill it with people. It brings economic development. That is the key tax revenue. That's the only way we're gonna fund these. Grants are great, I, I hope we can get as many grants as possible. But again, tax revenue is the number one key, which is economic development. People ask me, well, what, building strip malls, what is that gonna do? It's gonna lower rents. If you lower the rent, you're gonna be able to bring people into the city who wanna come out of their homes and work in a building, 
work in a front, a storefront. We need to take all our small businesses, which I heard there's approximately 4,000 small businesses out there. We need to take those small businesses and have them move into these storefronts. The more storefronts we bring, the more tax revenue. Homes are great, but they do not substantially take care of our tax dollars. We need to continue to work on economic development. So that's where I think we need to do. And again, grants are great, but tax revenue is the number one way to get this without raising taxes, that is. Thank you. All right. For the other four, thank you. For the other four candidates, 30 seconds. Anybody want to add anything to what's been said? Mr. Manfredi. When we talk about youth in the city of Maricopa, we have to make sure we understand what we're talking about, okay? It's not just um, what the city can do. It's what we do already. When we have people like the students that participated today, and I want to give everybody, please give them a hand. They work so hard, so hard to make sure that we came to you and were able to talk to you. There's a young lady in the back of the room, Priscilla, with the Be Awesome Youth Coalition. If you really want to do something with children after school, please contact her, talk to her. She can help you figure out what, you, what things you can do after school. She has classes that run, she has organ, um, meetings that happen on Monday, um, I think it's Mondays, is it Mondays? Yeah, so she has classes that run, or, or meetings that run. Get in contact with Priscilla, get in contact with all of the organizations working with children and kids and, and teens, because there's stuff out there. We have to make sure we engage and take care of it. Thank you. Mr. Marsh. Along with uh, Ted Yoakum and Al Brandenburg, I'm on the board of the Maricopa Multicultural Consortium. This is a group of people that are working to uh, get a community center built here in Maricopa. It's, it's a vision for the far out future. We know it's not going to happen immediately. But one of the functions we see at that center, that community center, is a combination of senior center services and younger people's services. After school programs is one of those where um, seniors could actually participate in youth services and child care services um, and maybe some other program like teaching kids how to code. Uh, that's, that's happening all over the country today. It's not happening here yet. Um, I think uh, we could make some moves in that direction, some strategic moves before we have a community center maybe used to using Copper Sky facilities, something like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. White. Well, I had almost decided, <clears throat> excuse me, almost decided not to go forward with the 30 seconds, so I want to stay with our time and, and appreciate the time. Uh, however, we, we have an opportunity right now. We have a, a newly uh, hired director of community services, uh, Nathan. And he comes from an organization that has many, many after-school programs uh, that we may be able to benefit from his experience. Uh, the, the budget process won't allow for it, but we might be able to, um, uh, with, with additional tax revenues, we should be able to, to do what we need to do in order to bring those programs to uh, fruition. Thank you. Ms. Morgan? One of the things that I advocate is small business. I've been a part of the small business community here in the 11 years I've been here. And that is one of the things that will bring in revenue. It's great to have all the fast food restaurants and it's great to have what we have. We're not gonna get a lot of the big stores until 347 is fixed. So what I wanna do is reach out to the community. There's a lot of talent here. There's a lot of people here who would like to start a restaurant. I have talked to these people. I've gone out and I've talked to people that have wanted to start businesses here and couldn't. So we need to change that. We need to reach out to the creative people that we have here in Maricopa. And instead of the revenue coming, we don't get revenue actually from the big businesses that come here. We need to be able to get revenue by tapping the talent of the very talented citizens of Maricopa, reach out to small business, set up the shops, the restaurants and things. We can do that and that will bring in revenue, and that is one of the things I also advocate is the community center. The seniors were promised that way back before they built Copper Sky and they didn't get it. And we're gonna change that this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, our next question comes from Peg. Thank you, thank you all for stepping up to run for council. 
This question specifically is directed for Ms. Morgan, Ms. Ritchie, and Ms. Caracelli. Learning to be a city council member, the best way to do that is to be a city council member. When I look out from the dais, I haven't seen you at many meetings. So what are you doing to prepare yourself for the role that you're about to embark on because you make your first decision the night you're sworn in? Ms. Morgan? Um, if you haven't seen me at the city council meetings, I don't know why. Maybe I'm not blingy enough, but uh, I've been there. And if you look at some of the uh, tapes and videos and television shows and newspapers that have s followed the things I've said, I go to the city council meetings and I get involved and I've been very involved. I'm one of the people that got up there and talked to them about global water and trying to bring down the prices of, of the citizens. I started the coalition, Stop Global Water Coalition, a long time ago. I was the one that went up to the city council and talked about the MCE program that was wasting the taxpayers' money. And so I'm sorry if you haven't seen me, but I have been attending. And uh, just check the newspapers or look at your feed from the television stations, and you'll see that I have very much been there and I have been involved. Thank you. Ms. Richard. I would say you're absolutely right. There have been cases. I have not been involved at all in this last few years and even in the last few months where my candidacy should have been an absolute priority, where I have not gone to every single meeting. However, I've, I'm definitely trying my best to do my due diligence. I've been receiving a lot of advice as far as going online, seeing our city council uh, videos that are up and posted, re go, going research far back as two, three years. I'm trying my best to as not only know about the recent history of Maricopa, but also why we have our ordinances, our city planning, our laws, our zoning committees, the way our city is, the way it is. I'm trying to see ultimately at home by myself. It's not as visible as it should have been. I greatly apologize that I have not been more visible because it does definitely cast a shade on me as a candidate that I may not seem as for my city as I am. But I ultimately, I want to change that perspective. So I really appreciate this. If nothing else, it's advice that I need to be more visible with this. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Ms. Caracelli. I have missed three council meetings since January, three. I'm four foot nine inches tall, so I don't know, maybe that has something to do with not seeing me. I don't know. But Vice Mayor Chapados, I re distinctly remembered at your workshop that you said you wanted to see each of us there. I have not forgotten that. I've also contacted you when I've had a question. You have graciously answered me, and I appreciate that. But I've only missed three. One, because of a class that I have. As I stated, I'm in my master's program for administrative education. The second one, I was in Italy. I'm sorry, but I took a little vacation. And the third one, again, was due to class. I, my mom is in the audience. She can tell you. I am an avid researcher. My office is a hot mess. I just cleaned it this morning. <laughs> I have an avid researcher. I'm constantly printing things out. I'm highlighting. I'm looking through to see what can I do to broaden my platform and how I can be a great city council member. Vice Mayor, did you direct that to Mr. Vitiello as well, or just the three? Okay, I wasn't sure, thank you. All right, I've been told we have a little more time, so we're gonna be able to give each candidate a minute to answer any more of the general questions. So, next question, please. The next question comes from, is it Walter? That mic's a little soft, and make sure you speak okay, right into it, please. Okay, can you hear me please. okay? Um, this, this question is directed to anybody who'd like to address it. What can the city do or should do, if anything, to help those adults who can't take care of themselves, the handicapped, the disabled, special needs people. All right, let's start down with Ms. Morgan and we'll go all the way around. So we'll just start and come this way and then we'll go back that way. So Ms. Morgan, you each have a minute, please. Um, basically the question is what can the city do to help persons with disabilities and the less fortunate, right? Yes. Okay, um, many, many, many years I have worked with um, the disabled. I was a teacher for kids with special needs and all of that, as well as the show business stuff that I did. And uh, that's a program that's always been very close to my heart. We're one of the people, organizations that uh, um, got that out. I got an award for that in Los Angeles, as a matter of fact, in California for that. Um, 
what the uh, schools can do, what the legislatures can do, what the uh, city council can do, get together and talk about what it is you want, what we need. One of the things that I want to do, and one of the things I've already brought to um, the powers that be, is that I wanted to start a small shelter for animals because the shelter in Casa Grande is overrun, and I wanted to combine that with a homeless shelter, a place where the homeless have to go to take a shower and go to uh, dress up if they have dress if they have a, uh, an appointment or a job interview or at least a place to, to rest. I think that there's a way to make a vision like that work. As far as working with the disabled, I really don't know what programs are in effect, but whatever programs there are or there are not, talk to me and we'll work on doing that because that's kind of also my wheelhouse because I've worked with that so many years that we can put our heads together and find a solution to that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Marsh. A large percentage of the people, people who are disabled and needy are, are seniors. Um, and I'm not, I'm not just a one-issue candidate. Um, and I know we're not going to get a senior center anytime soon. But I think at least we could staff a position, at least part-time, in City Hall that pushed for bringing in landing senior services in Maricopa. Right now, you have to go to Florence or Casa Grande in order to get any degree of senior services. I think that's a, a mistake on our part, part given that 20% of our population is, is seniors. Uh, we're not a retirement community, we're an active, alive, alive community. But all of us are getting older. I know I am. Some of you are too. Um, <laughs> let's, 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 work toward, let's work toward providing for our futures and our parents' futures here in Maricopa, so they don't have to go out of town to get these services. Thank you. Mr. Manfredi. That's a very important issue, and it's a great question to ask. When we look at our citizens, yes, a lot of them are seniors. A lot of them, uh, not a lot, but some of them have disabilities. When, when the senior center here in the city of Maricopa, which used to be called our COPA Center, closed, I worked with Dr. Chestnut to bring us uh, the ability to have somewhere where seniors can meet. And that's out of school. We got two classrooms. And it gives us that ability to at least give a place where seniors can meet. But that's not everything we need to do. Um, Peg is working hard along with Nancy on our age-friendly committee. They do what's called um, uh, di uh, different events where they brought in the affair here to the city of Maricopa that brings services to seniors. Um, and as we, as we already mentioned, a lot of the pe folks here that need a little hand with assistance with um, disabilities are seniors, so that brings that here. But when you look at it, we have to look at the role of government and what that role is. It's the health and well-being of our citizens. So there has to be the ability for us to work to bring services to our, our constituents, to our citizens, that will help them when they have disabilities. Thank you. Mr. Wade. I would like for you to please stop by my booth and get a flyer on the disability program that I'm going to have with my councilman on the corner on Saturday. Saturday at 9 a.m. between 9 and 10.30 at Global Water, we will have a representative from the Empowerment, uh, Empowerment Center in Phoenix who also has contacts with Pinal County. This is a, my effort to try to make sure that we get the word out to folks about issues that are of concern. So Saturday morning, please stop by the booth first, get a flyer. Saturday morning, 9 o'clock, Global Water. And, and really quickly, I'll tell you why I chose Global Water as a place for this uh, council member on the corner. I had a constituent contact me and said they could not get into Global Water to pay their bill because their wheelchair was not accessible and they didn't have a button outside the door to open the door. Global Water jumped on it, fixed it, took care of it. That's the kind of citizen that we want in our community. That's the kind of corporate citizen that we want in our community as well as us. So 9 o'clock, the 11th of August, Global Water, we'll talk about disabilities in the family. Thank you. Ms. Caracelli. It's my understanding we have a facility here in Maricopa that's located in the Duke Plaza. Um, I think they are still there. It's called the, they're uh, connected with the Arizona Handicap Foundation. That's a state program and they receive funding through there, but they need additional funding. I work with students who are physically handicapped and I also know of people here in Maricopa personally 
who are handicapped as adults and they need additional resources. I think it would behoove us to have these organizations, the numerous ones that we have here in our city, to come together, to work together, collaborate, to see what can we do collectively to ensure the resources are there. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Ms. Ritchie. So this question is so important, and I really appreciate you asking it. And I absolutely agree with Bob, it does affect so many people, and I don't wanna take away from that, because while it does especially affect seniors, and it affects my father, it affects a lot of people in my life directly, it is something that each individual person needs to work on. As a community, it's, it should be a priority. Uh, in my work with the Department of Economic Security, our motto wasn't necessarily resources, resources, resources but it's so important to have someone on speed dial that you can call and get that phone number. You can get that information in a second. You can be there. And I think that's what Maricopa needs, is we need more accessibility, not just doors, and absolutely everyone needs to be uh, accessible for disabled persons, but also we need to have these resources within reach in our community. Uh, brick and mortar buildings, local communities for it, we need to absolutely make those on our agenda as a community. Mr. Vitiello. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to keep bringing it all back to economic development, but that's where it really is the key. When my parents both came down with dementia, I took them in. There are no resources here, and I understand, and that's okay. When I moved here, I realized what I was getting myself into. It's going to take time. It's going to take funding, whether it be grants. Disability is from, there's all ages. So whether it's not only just seniors, it's little kids. So this is a very, very difficult and hard question to answer. I appreciate it. I don't have the answer. I'll be very honest with you. But I will work hard. And I will work hard to make sure that we can bring stuff here, not only for our seniors, but all ages of disability. The word disability doesn't just take on seniors. It takes on everybody. And that's where we need to make sure from top to bottom, whatever age group we're talking about. But again, economic development is the key to funding these programs. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, our next question is actually a social media question. All right. Go ahead, please. So we have a question from the In Maricopa Facebook Live from our councilwoman, Julia Gussie. This is throwing it back a little bit, but um, she said, the Be Awesome Youth Group is a grant funded. As a council member, do you feel that the city should help fund these youth programs? All right, we'll start with Ms. Ritchie on this one. Did you understand the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and that is my answer, absolutely. I feel like the city absolutely should take responsibility, especially with such a big portion of my platform being got geared toward youth and giving them a leg up. I know especially growing up in Maricopa, I have been, I keep saying how privileged I've been to have such a close-knit community to help guide me to where I want to be, help me make the decisions. I know so many 20-year-olds who don't know what they're going to do next. I don't know what they're, they don't know what they're going to do tomorrow, and I'm so privileged to be in a community that has inspired me so much. And I think absolutely it's, the, it's necessary for our city to fund, uh, especially programs like the Awesome Youth Coalition, to continue and further that uh, motivation for our students, that backing of our youth. Thank you. Mr. Vitiello. I attended a great function that they put on about two weeks ago. We went to Ultra Star and we got to swipe these cards and play these games. But let me ask you this. Funding, we can't fund everything. How do we choose it? Everybody wants it. We want Senior Center. We want something for the kids. We want something for everybody in the city. So when you ask me, will I continue to fund one thing? It's a difficult question because how do I know which is the right one to fund? I want to help everybody in the city, but can we help everybody in the city? 
So that's where we need to really make sure. If there is funds available, the number one, if there is funds available, then we can fund these type of programs. I don't want to just fund seniors. I don't want to just fund you know, kids. I want to make sure that we can take care of everybody. And it's a difficult thing. The financial situation is the number one thing. And everything, all these questions keep revolving right back to economic development. And that's where I will work hard to see that we bring in extra tax revenue. So please understand. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, I've been here 11 years. Uh, my grandchildren, two of my grandchildren, graduated right from this school here and uh, went on to NAU and ASU and graduated magna cum laude. And so um, I definitely <laughs> back uh, funding programs for, for students and for kids. And, but as it's been said before, we can't fund everything through the typical taxes. I, for one, uh, my taxes went up $1,000 last year. Most of you got hit pretty hard. We can't just fund things through taxes. That's why we need, again, some right brain people to look at outside the box. Like I said, we have talent here in Maricopa. So rather than just looking into the funding, and we have grants too in place, and we have ways to get money, but we need to back our small businesses here because that's what's going to help us. Where you need to back businesses which are home-based or if they need a storefront, we need to maybe look at what the rent is for some of these businesses. And that's where we're going to get revenue. It cannot just be taxes because eventually that runs out and then people can't afford to live in their homes or pay exorbitant taxes. And we need to know what our taxes is going for. I don't want to pick up a newspaper anymore and read that another tax has been imposed that I didn't know anything about. But if we all work together as a community, we can find ways, like I said, to bring in the funding through the small businesses, the entrepreneurs in this town, those of us that have run small businesses here, and that gives back to the community. Mr. Marsh. Education has come a long way in the past 30 years. Uh, it's no longer just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Um, there's a lot of social enrichment going on for young people, for adults, for seniors. Um, and some of it gets to be funded by the school system. Some of it gets to be funded by uh, city, county, state, and federal resources. Um, I know that in the city council, budgeting is a very complex process. And it's something that the council takes very seri seriously. It's a collaborative process. It's not the work of one person. You prioritize all the things that you want to get done, all the things that your constituents want to get done. And then you price them out in a spreadsheet. And you draw a line where you run out of money. Everything below the line doesn't get done. Everything above the line does. I do hope that many of these social programs for our young people and for our seniors do get pushed above the line in, in the coming years. Thank you. Mr. Manfredi. Priscilla knows I love her and her organization. I'll do anything I can to help them. But no, um, it should not be funded by the city. Um, it shouldn't. Uh, she works with funding right now through grants. I think the city has a role. And the city's role is to help out when, when it can. Um, and the city council members do that. But full funding of, of an organization outside of the city um, organization, then no. I don't think it should be funded fully by the city. Um, but as I said, she works well with grants, and the grants are really doing well for her today. Um, and I always offer, and I say, when, when grant time comes around and she's doing grants, I'm like, tell me what letter you need. I'll be happy to write it in support of your organization, because I believe they do great things. But you know, we're going to have a, just a little bit of extra money this year than we had last year. And we had to make a choice what to do with that extra money. I guess we could give it to nonprofits or something like that, or we can hire more staff that can help with economic development and firefighters. Thank you. Mr. White. I, I agree with my fellow council member. You know, yes, I do care about uh, many organizations, including the Be Awesome and have contributed to many of them and actually gotten accused of 
misusing funds because we we're contributing to those organizations. Uh, it's a little strange for me when we use taxpayer dollars to assist taxpayers, but you know, that's what that is. Um, yeah, I, I can't see that we would do that. I can see that we would assist, and that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. Uh, would be awesome, and, and other organizations out there. Uh, I just want to make one correction as well, in addition. On Saturday, also, um, Chief Stahl's Coffee with the Chief will be presenting their um, uh, special needs registry. And that's another part of an issue where we are trying to assist the disabled community. Um, you know, that. The, the idea of supporting the community in any way we possibly can is not foreign. Uh, we were doing it before when we had funds that we were funding um, uh, organizations, previously larger funds. And so if we can do something to help that organization run a little, sm a little smoother, a little, a little, um, uh, a little sharper, uh, a little more impactful, then I believe that we should take those uh, steps to do it. It's just a matter of how we do it. Ms. Caracelli. I would say yes. I will always pretty much say yes to children if it's within reason and if the resources are available. Programs like Ms. Priscilla's is very important. I've worked with her over the years and she's done some phenomenal programming. We've done some phenomenal programming together. It takes a village to raise a child, ladies and gentlemen. We need a foundation. Children need a foundation. They are the basis of our society. If we don't mold and groom them, we're in trouble. So programs like hers need funding. She pretty much always gets the grant money. But if it, the resources are there and we have it, I say, why not? And I have come out of my pocket personally to give money to different organizations because I believe in what they're trying to do. Mr. Wade, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I just, I just want to make sure I'm clear in your mind uh, in terms of my position on this. Uh, yeah, I believe that children are important. I believe uh, that we need to make sure that they're provided for and cared for. But I also understand that we have a city to run as well. And as Bob pointed out earlier, you can't do everything for all people, but what you can do, you do, and you do it with, with glee and support of that organization because you're right, children are important. They're our future. And if we don't provide for them, then we are, our future is not uh, our future is in a different uh, direction. So, thank you. Right, next question, please. Um, our next question comes from Tina. Miss Dugan. Here it comes. Not everyone. <laughs> Only those that are special. <laughs> My question is very simple and I'm asking for just one answer. What could our city do better to help the small businesses in our town? All right, let's start with Mr. Pitiello. We need to go to the developers, plain and simple. The more developers that we can bring into this city and build, whether we want to call them strip malls or plats, whatever we want to call them, very important, competition. That is the number one way we can keep or bring down, which we all know, bring down rent. We are $24 a square foot approximately on average. About two or three years ago, I went with a buddy of mine and he wanted to open up something here and everything we looked at was $24 a square foot. We went up to Scottsdale, we went up to Chandler, it was $17 a square foot. And they were offering more money for a build out. We see a lot of businesses going out of business here because of the high rent. So, if we build more strip malls, if we build, not us, not the city, I don't want to be a landlord, but if we're able to get developers to come into the city and build more strip malls, like I said, we're going to be able to keep the rent. Competition always brings down the rent. So remember, that's the easiest way to do it. Hope that answers your question, Tina. Ms. Morgan, please. Okay, first of all, I want to apologize a little bit earlier because I wasn't quite clear on something. I, I don't always get up and talk when I go to the city council meetings. Um, on the third 
uh, third Tuesday of every month is the chamber thing, and I always kind of like kind of glide into the council meeting, sit in the back, and then leave. So sometimes you don't notice me there, but I am there more than you think I am. So I don't always talk when I'm there <laughs> or make my presence known. Um, Again, this is where we go into why I feel that a person who is not a politician, who is a citizen such as yourself, because I, I believe in programs too, and, I, and every time I come to the city with programs, I hear the same thing. A million dollars, 10 years. A million dollars, 10 years. That doesn't have to be the case. I even said, I want to build a non-equity 99-seat theater. First thing I heard, a million dollars, I'm going, no. It's not going to cost a million dollars because I did three of them in California and I know better than that. You can start out smaller, but you can grow. And that's something that the citizens can get involved in doing. So I definitely support small business because I have a small business. I've been very active with the Chamber of Commerce for 11 years since I've lived here to promote small businesses. That is the future of Maricopa, as a matter of fact, especially until we get 347 widened and we can get other businesses in here. But I believe in small businesses, and I believe that we can find other constructive ways to raise money, different fundraising, theme things. I'm working with the food bank now on a, on a project to try to bring some more revenue into the food bank by having a, 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 an April in Paris in uh, April, wine tasting. The wine tastings used to work. It used to bring this in the morning, money. People got busy. So Thank this you. is what I want to do is go outside the box and look at different ways to bring in revenue to fund the small businesses and help you. Thank you. Mr. Marsh. Okay, point number one. I think um, we need to make sure that we get an anchor employer, a large employer here in, in the city in the coming years. This will provide, provide a platform for some smaller businesses, smaller businesses, smaller businesses to go in low orbit around them, and help them grow and provide services to them. Um, I think also, just looking out of the box, number two, um, I think we need to pull together a redevelopment authority for the heritage district and bring their in infrastructure up to current code, so that new businesses going in in the cent in our core center, the heart of Maricopa don't have to fund enormous projects to handle sewer, water, power, electricity, getting out of the floodplain, et cetera. Uh, I think it's due to the Heritage District to do this. And I think there might, might be some um, federal funds available, state funds available to help with the redevelopment district. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Manfredi. Thank you for the question. I um, own or partly own two businesses here in the city of Maricopa. I run small businesses. My, my um, I guess the solution is simple and, and people don't want to hear it, but get out of the way. I mean, if, if the government wants to be involved in every decision of your business, that's a bad thing. So if the city wants to help small businesses, get out of the way of small business. Small business people do not need hand-holding through every process they have. Now, when it comes to building a new, a new um, a building or something like that or development, yeah, they need some help getting through the processes. But I had a person call me two weeks ago who could not get a simple business license so they can transact business in the city of Maricopa easily. They wanted to do some zoning stuff and some other things. Stop. That's my way for the city to help business. Get out of the way of business. Let them get the license in they need and move on with their business and start making money. Because when they make money, they'll hire people. When they hire people, it creates economic development. And then they're looking for new places to be and new development. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, they got their license this week. Thank you. Yay. Mr. White. Yeah. <clears throat> Once again, I have to agree with my fellow council member. That's why we get along, I guess, so well. Uh, but yes, we need to get out of the way. And there are organizations who are, that are around to help small businesses grow and develop. You'll be hearing about a project here uh, fairly soon with an organization that's doing just that. They're taking steps to try to help small businesses come out of the shadows, come get licensed, and do the things that they're necessary in order to do in order for them to do good business. So there are organizations that exist to do that. Uh, like to see the, uh, the chamber rejuvenated, re-engaged. So that's one of those org types of organizations that, that can make that happen. So yes, get out of the way, let those organizations that have uh, the, the function ability to do the things they need to do to help small business. I, I owned a small business when I first got here and um, you know, it was 
tedious trying to go through the process. It really was. It was tedious. So whatever I can do, however I can support the small businesses and the organizations that support, support small businesses, I'm willing to do that to help them grow. Thank you. Ms. Caracelli. My husband owned a small business back in New Jersey, he had a DJ business. And watching him go through trying to build that business, the money that went out of our household to build that business, I have a little understanding. When you're supporting a small business, you're supporting a dream. It's very important that we support these dreams in our community because they make our community. Without these dreams, what do we really have here? So I'm willing to learn as much as possible because I will admit that it's not my area of expertise, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to have the city and we can take on some workshops so people can learn how do we get licenses? How do we come out of the shadows and operate efficiently and legally? I think that's what we need to do. Ms. Ritchie. I think it's funny because I get asked this question quite a lot, so this is really great, honestly, and it's such an important question because local businesses are the backbone of our community. Maricopa is a small community and we're growing every day, and to grow with it, we need to fund these dreams. We need to get out of the way for these businesses so that we can grow. That being said, as much as we need to get out of the way, there are some places that we can step in. Uh, one thing I hear all the time is specifically about rent and utilities, about how hard it is for local businesses to get in and do those things and how obviously uh, the landowners, the landlords, um, they'll keep those prices high and it makes it so difficult. And when supply and demand is so, isn't a big enough influence to change prices to create that sort of allowance for someone to come in and make a business, then we need to step in, and that could be in the form of grants. Obviously, it not, doesn't necessarily need to come through the city, but we need to have that in mind. We need to look into different ways that we can support those businesses that obviously aren't being supported in that way. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Manfredi, you had something else you wanted to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add in, and I'm sorry, because a minute's never long enough. When, when you look at it, a company like Apple, a company like Microsoft that starts in a garage and starts building computers, in the city of Maricopa, that would be impossible today because we would require um, uh, sprinklers and we'd require different fire codes, and we have to look at getting out of the way. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that to it. And grants are great, but what we have to understand is, you know, we can't rely on grants for p funding programs within the city of Maricopa. We have to understand that we have to help businesses grow organically, and getting out of the way of those businesses is how we do it. Thank you. Next question. Um, our next question comes from Bill Robertson. <laughs> I hear Bill Robertson, I get worried. <laughs> well, I want to address the white elephant in the room. I'm sorry. I don't see any beads of sweat. <laughs> <clears throat> There's been lately uh, some public uh, conversation about the discretionary fund that current council members use for and the purposes they use it for. So this is a two-part question. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. For the current councilman and previous councilman, what have you used it for? Do you believe in it and should we keep it? For the newcomers, do you believe in it and should we keep it and how would you use it? Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's start with our, our two incumbents. Um, Mr. Wade, we'll have you start first on the first part of the question on the dis use of discretionary funds. There was a point in time when we had a uh, fund for nonprofit organizations that was uh, excessive. And those funds were drawn back and the discretionary funds program became available for council members to be able to support organizations that exist. Um, under the guidelines that were presented for that purpose, for that program, and being uh, under the um, uh, ethics uh, bylaw or guidelines as well, those funds are used, I use those funds to try to support, as I said earlier, taxpayers with taxpayers' dollars. Nonprofit organizations, supporting organizations. Uh, it, it has been argued that part of those funds were 
actually contribute in my name, or not my name, but in individual council members' names. That's never been anything further from the truth. We, we support the organizations with those fundings. Do I think that they should continue? If we are not going to do something else to support small or, or nonprofit organizations and those kinds of organizations, then I very well think that they should continue. If there is some tweaking that needs to be done to the guidelines in order to make it maybe different or give better transparency or what have you, let's by all means do that. But if we can support those organizations that need our help, then I think that we should continue to do that and, and, be, and feel good about the fact that the city is doing the right thing for the community. Right, Mr. Manfredi. It's safe to say um, the article that came out came out a couple, well, a week ago, I believe it was, and it was by a former council member who at the time when he was on council had the ability to spend about $300,000 a year in spending on nonprofit organizations. The article addressed $7,500, I think. We help nonprofits. If you, if you go to a, you go to the, if your kids or yourself go to Maricopa High School, raise your hand. If you work with the food bank, raise your hand. If you work with Be Awesome Youth Coalition, raise your hand. Or any other organization in the city of Maricopa, including Copa Film Festival, raise your hand. These are organizations that we help. Now, we don't fund them fully, but when they need $50, I'm glad. To, to talk to my, my staff and say, hey, can you make sure a check is written out for Be Awesome Youth Coalition? Can you get a check out to Copa, Copa Shorts Film Festival? They need $100 to sponsorship on their, on, their, on their event. So yeah, I will continue to use it as we, as a council, has budgeted for. These are budgeted monies. This is money that we as a council met together, talked about it, and decided that we can use as a council and why we can use it. It's for the betterment of, betterment, that's New Jersey right there, hey, it's for the betterment of society. It's for the betterment, betterment of the community. We're looking hard at what we can do to help our community, and our discretionary funds are that, discretionary funds that we use to help others. Thank you. All right, Mr. Wade, I'll come back to you. Let's start with Mr. Marsh. Um, you understand the question? You need it repeated? I think the question is, for the other five, would you continue the use of discretionary funds? Mr. Marsh. Okay. I think if you're electing somebody to city council and you're trusting that, that responsibility with them, I, th I think $7,500 a year, year discretionary spending is reasonable. But I think that as with everything else city council does, I think it should be by consent across the rest of council. I think people should put together their spending budgets on a weekly or monthly basis, whatever they want, and run it through the council meeting so there's transparency, so that the, the public gets to see the money being spent, so that um, the money can still get out there quickly and easily. But, but by consent across all of the council, not just by single person action. Thank you. I'll come back to you. Ms. Caroselli. I'm gonna do something that teachers don't like. I'm gonna ask a question. Would you to like to repeat it? No, I know the question, but I have a question in order to answer the question. Is that I'm sorry. Can I do that? Okay, because I want to make sure I have a clear understanding. So, is there a system of checks and balances with this? Okay, and the whole council has to have it approved. And your budget goes to the state for approval, yes? What was that? Does, does it go to the state for approval or it goes to the, your city approves it, council approves the budget, correct? This is. Okay, um, right. what's the problem? That's my question. I think that's what the question is when we say discretionary funds. People want to make sure they're being used properly. They want to make sure that you're not giving to your friend Billy Bob and to Susie Sally May. That's what the problem is. That's the problem. I agree with that. I don't want my tax dollars going to your buddy either. So that's why I asked, was there a checks and balance? So if the entire council comes together and they're not doing it as a single person because they work as an entity, I don't see a problem with using discretionary funds for organizations that need it. I like what you said about using taxpayer money to help taxpayers. It's going right back to you. So I think that's awesome. I say yes. Ms. Richie. I think it's absolutely important, not necessarily 
that this needs to be kept. I think it's important that it, to recognize that, yes, of course, it's had those checks and balances and that we need to continue maintaining it. Anything that has any kind of, I mean, I think the word discretionary throws people off. When you think about anything being at Sounds like everything's green and should continue to stay that way. Thank you. Mr. Vitiello. Remember the word discretionary. It could be used for the nonprofits. It could be used for many other things. I myself will not use discretionary funds. Because who am I going to pick? I've got roughly $9,000, I believe it is. Yes, Eight. no? Eight. Uh, how do I know which one to give it to? They're all good. They all have it. If I need to donate, I will reach into my own pocket and I will donate. So not, there's nothing wrong with what's been going on. It's by law. It's state law. Everything's good. But again, I myself will donate along with my wife because we do it together. So that's where I stand on discretionary funds. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Okay, discretionary funds, tax funds, all of it. My whole point about everything, and one of the reasons I know this race was transparency. Okay? There shouldn't be questions about where the discretionary funds went. Just be upfront with it. Talk it over with the taxpayers. Tell them what your ideas are. I think that when you get together as a council and you have meetings, you decide maybe I want to fund over here. This is a good idea and I want to use my funds over here. And as long as we are open about it and people know where the money is going, if it's going to benefit the city of Maricopa, then I don't see a problem with it at all. Um, I think that sometimes rumors happen because people haven't been quite as open. I don't feel the council up until now has been quite open enough with us about where the funds have been going, that we've been paying them. I didn't know about the uh, money pit of the MCE where they spent all that money and they didn't bring in a single business for three years until I got more involved in the city council. And this is something that I think is why we need to ask them for more transparency. I'm sorry, but I want to know where every dime goes. I think they owe it to me. It's my money. It's your money. I want to know where it all goes, discretionary or not. I want to know where our money goes. And I will say this, that the people up here on this council have been very good and have been very open about where the money have gone and have stood for the taxpayers. I can tell you that from experience. Thank you. Mr. Wade, you wanted to follow up on something? Okay, Mr. Manfredi. Thank you very much. And I was sitting there kind of like jittery in my seat. Of course I want to follow up on it. You know, it's great that Rich mentioned he's going to use his own money. I've probably spent about $20,000 of my own or my company's money in the last year alone helping nonprofits in the city of Maricopa. I also work with, with those organizations. I volunteer my time. I put hundreds of hours within a year working with nonprofits in the city of Maricopa. When, when a nonprofit that I'm helping carrying food boxes to a car says to me, the meat in that box is going to defrost and I'm going to lose it all because the freezer broke, I don't have time to go and sit down and contact each council member, wait for, the, wait for the first or second Tuesday of the month, and then negotiate with my council members about if I can help them buy a freezer. That's what discretionary funds are for. You elect us as your council members to work on your behalf. If you don't trust us, don't elect us. We work hard for you. We don't, we don't spend money on, on going out and having beers and dinner with our friends. Discretionary money is used to help nonprofits. Every single thing we do is open and transparent. I've said many of times, if you want to see discretionary funds, I'll email them to you. I know Barry over there asked me for it the other day, but I haven't been able to sit at a computer in the last two days, but I'll get it to him. For me, I get my discretionary funds, I spend them on mostly travel benefiting the city. So when we say $8,000, $8,000 is not given to um, nonprofits. Most of our money for discretionary funds is used to fly to maybe Washington because we're gonna fight and get an overpass done and get a $15 million TIGA grant. Is that worth it? Yes. 
When we spend money, like Mayor Price will spend money to go to every ADOT meeting in, in Arizona. Drive all around, might have to stay overnight. That's discretionary funding. When we have to spend money on- Mr. Um, Manfredi, your time is up. Thank sorry. you. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> I hate time limits. Next question, please. Um, our next question comes from Ben Johnson. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, I am new to Maricopa, and uh, my question is in regards to a little bit of a safety process um, that uh, in, in my neighborhood that there are not enough street lights. Um, and what So what you have to look at is they maintain them, they own them, and we have to work with them, of course, and use money where we see fit. So when, when funding comes up, we're going to have um, discussions about our budget coming up, and we need to really work on finding a place where we can add some streetlights in the Heritage District. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wade. <clears throat> yeah, that was one of the things that surprised me when I first moved into Maricopa, how dark it was, and then they talked about the dark sky issue. And, and yes, I believe it is a safety issue. Now, the fact that we are the third safest city uh, in Arizona does not necessarily uh, give you an indication that there's a lot of crime, a high crime rate, but there is crime. And darkness does breed, does allow for crime to, to exist. So if there is a way for us to be able to motivate, uh, when we look at new developments and, and motivate EV3 uh, to uh, offer more, then that's what we should do. And I think one thing too that should be taken into consideration in the dark skies is most homes have two lights on their, on their garage. And that was by design. Those uh, homes were built that way so that you could illuminate your home with the, the lights on, on your garage to kind of cut, cut, take over or, or compensate for the dark sky. But whatever we can do to try to help keep the city safe, uh, keep it safer, I think public safety does a really good job right now, but doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation about maybe improvement on it. All right, Ms. Caracelli. I learned that information with you that evening. I didn't know that either. I grew up that you had to be home when the street lights came on. I was telling my age a little bit here. I think you, the citizens, and myself as a citizen, have more power collectively to do that than city council. I've never ever had an issue in Maricopa. I've go, I travel for school, I've never had an issue. Every time I've had, uh, I've had the misfortune of being in a car accident, it's not been in Maricopa, I've never had any issues here. But as far as improving our safety, this is absolutely a concern. It's something, of course, one of our citizens has brought up and it's definitely not an issue. I'm sure you're not the only person who's ever considered how terrible it could be, how threatening it might be. So I absolutely think it's something we can improve upon, um, but I do definitely, I cannot, I lost my train of thought, my apologies. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Vitiello. I live in Cobblestone, and when the lights go, when, the, when it becomes dark, every light in Cobblestone goes on, on your front porch. I've driven through neighborhoods that they don't go on because you have to flip the switch. It's none of my business why you don't. But couldn't we just ask the builders to simply put sensors on every single house? It can't cost that much. Now, when I was nominated for the 2040, 2040 Visionary Committee, I was nominated for public safety. And I, I want to remember, and I, I wish I could go to Chief Stoll on this one, but I want to remember that I think we were putting in there that we were going to have street lights on every single corner. I don't want to definitely say that was 100%, but why not have the builder do it? Again, they're building the streets, they're building everything. Let's have them not only put simple sensors, because you could see across the street, I can look at my neighbors, I could see them walk out of their house. Same thing with, build, with the builder could actually put these street lights up. It does cost money, but again, incorporated into the, um, when they, put up the developments, plain and simple. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. One of the things I like about Maricopa is when I take my dog out at night, and she gets me up sometimes in the middle of the night, 
Let me stand out there and look up at the stars, and I can see the stars. I grew up in Indiana. I can see the stars. I moved to Los Angeles. I forgot what they looked like. Um, sensors are right. We have them in province. Everybody should have lights on their garages. I don't think that street lights, we had street lights on the main parkways. I don't think that street lights in the HOAs is the solution. I, myself, I put in little uh, glass bricks, a courthouse around my front porch and it lights it just enough. Um, if an area is that dark with the street light, with the um, um, house lights and the garage lights and all of that, then maybe somebody has lights out. If there's a dark area, maybe reflectors. I'm sorry. Um, that's what I feel uh, we should look into other ways of doing it other than putting street lights in every neighborhood. Because then we're going to, we might as well move to Los Angeles and not see the stars anymore. And I would miss that a lot. I think that there's other ways, again, thinking outside the box to bring light where we need it and keep the crime rate down without ruining the beautiful sky that we have at night. Thank you. Mr. Marsh. I think for the subdivisions that were built before streetlights were a requirement, um, I think th those HOAs do require their, or at least request that their uh, homeowners, renters, turn on their garage lights, their carriage lights, and their front porch lights at night to light the area around the house. Now, if you're putting in a 40-watt bulb, that's your problem. But um, it should be like 90, 100-watt bulbs to mimic a streetlight. I think the uh, dark sky legislation is important. We've got a, an astronomy um, center 100 miles south of here on top of Kitt Peak that are doing uh, essential research. Um, and dark sky uh, helps that Kitt Peak National Observatory to operate and function. They can't op operate if uh, our lights are blinding them. So when we, when we approve the lights for, for copper sky, we approve them on the grounds that um, the reflectors would keep the light pointing down, not up, to lighten the sky. So I'm, I'm a supporter of dark sky. I think the HOAs have to handle it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Manfredi. You went first? All right, thank you. Late, no, I know you will. We want to let you. Though. Thank you, though. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, we're going to give each of the candidates 90 seconds to make a closing statement. Before we uh, proceed with that, We've had, thank you for being here today. If you've been here all day, you've heard that there's been quite a bit of discussion about our children, whether it's education, after school programs, safety. And, and today we've had a great example of the wonderful youth that we have here in Maricopa. If you were here early today, you saw the band, you saw our honor color guard. We have had youth that have been helping throughout the day and helping to put on the event, making sure people were in the right place and had the things that they need. Would you join with me in recognizing our youth? One of the things that I've come to appreciate about living here in Maricopa is our access accessibility to candidates and those who are in public office. We've had the opportunity to hear from those running for federal office, state office, and local office. Again, if you join with me in thanking all of the candidates who have taken their time to be here and talk with us and share their views. Some of you may have seen we've had the presence today of a couple of Maricopa's finest who have made sure that we have been safe. Uh, some of that may not have been quite so visible, but we certainly want to thank the Maricopa Police Department for being here and supporting this and helping us have a safe environment. Also want to give thanks to the Maricopa Unified School District and the high school for making the facility available. We've had the air conditioning going all day. It's been a comfortable uh, environment to be in. So thanks to the high school and to the school district for making this available.
and to in Maricopa for organizing it, putting us together, giving us an all opportunities to spend a day with the candidates that will affect our lives over the next two to four years. Thank you, in Maricopa. <laughs> all right, we will start with Mr. Manfredi and go in reverse order and end with Mr. Wade. So Mr. Manfredi, 90 seconds, please. Don't start yet. Thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you so much to the candidates who took time out of their schedule today because knocking on doors is very important these days. Um, so thank you to you. Thank you to the people who came here and sat here all day. I got here, I think it was like 8.30 this morning. I've been here, at, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is, like six? Um, I got here, I've been here all day. I've been working hard, talking to people and understanding exactly what the issues are for Maricopa. You know, 90 seconds is never going to be enough to talk to you about everything you need. So I host every other, uh, once, at least once a month, I host on Thursdays a Facebook live event. My last one went, I believe it was like two and a half hours of me talking and people asking questions. And we worked through some issues that they had and, some, and we solved some problems too. That's pretty cool. So we're never going to have enough time. I think we've been up here about an hour. Um, so please contact your candidates. Talk to them, meet with them, have coffee. Understand that there's so much more than a 30 second sound bite. There's so much more than the signs on the road. There's so much more than the, the mail, mailer you get or the things stuffed in your door or from that five second or 20 second visit at the door when you say, yeah, thank you, and close the door on us as we walk around. There's so much more. Talk to us. We want to engage you. Everybody up here, I believe, wants to engage and wants to talk, talk and chat. I only have two seconds, so VincentManfredi.com, VincentManfredi.com, VincentManfredi.com. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Marsh. I hope everybody here understands how exciting it is to live in a new city, a city that doesn't have a couple hundred years of infrastructure to deal with, to contend with, to repair, to maintain. I, I've participated in city councils in other cities, not as a member, as a citizen, and th they're dealing with problems that we don't have and we never will have, well, at least not for another couple hundred years. It's, it's exciting to be a contributor here. I've worked on the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Board of Adjustment, the Zoning Rewrite Code, the Subdivision Rewrite Ordinance Committee, uh, the 2040 Vision, and the, the general plan. Um, we wrote, we designed an exciting future for Maricopa, and I'm excited to be a part of moving this forward. I hope I get to move to the next level and participate on council. It's MaricopaVoteForBob.com, and the three key words are vote for Bob. Thanks. <laughs> Ms. Morgan. Hi. Okay, just briefly, I wanted to, I know we've been here a long time, and thank you so much for, for uh, sitting here this long and uh, attending this. This is important. I'm glad that you are here because an informed voter, that's a good voter. That is somebody that cares about the community as much as we up here care about the community. None of us would be up here if we didn't care about Maricopa. Believe me, like I said, I'm retired. I didn't just wake up and from my might tie and say, hey, let's see what I can do to make my life more complicated. I care about Maricopa as you do. I care about the taxpayers. I care about the citizens and I care about the schools. I care about the seniors. The seniors is a big deal for me because when I lost my husband, I had no services here. Um, I had to go to Casa Grande. I had to go to Chandler. There was nothing for me here. That's not fair. That's not right. You're grieving, you're going through something. You should be able to do it here in your hometown with your friends. You should not have to travel. You've got enough that's upsetting. I mean, I would, didn't even trust myself to drive all the time because I would just start crying and I'd have to pull over to the side of the road. So seniors need more things here. We've been promised a lot of stuff since the time I got here before they built Copper Sky. They've been promised things, and they've never kept their promises to the seniors. So that's one of the strongest things that I'm advocating. Like I said, the homeless and the poor and the animals. I am 
adamant about saving the animals. The shelters are overcrowded, and we need to have a no-kill shelter for these animals to go in, even temporarily, to get out of the out of the uh, weather here in Maricopa. We can't rely on Pinal County Ms. to Morgan, do it all. Morgan, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia Morgan. Mr. Vitiello. Ladies and gentlemen, like I said, thank you very much. Thank you all the candidates. I, and I do believe every single one of you has the same heart that I have. And that's the heart to try to do what's best for the city and what's best for you. That's why we're here. That's why I'm here. 13 years ago when I came to this city, I ran into a, a gentleman playing softball. He was the mayor. All I ever did was talk to Kelly Anderson every night after we played softball. And one day I said to him, Kelly, why do you know everything? He says, because I'm the mayor. I had no idea. I mean, it was just Kelly, and I traveled a ton. Well, I'm here now. I'm here to put my 27 years of international business experience to work for you. And that's what I'm here for. I'm here for a job today. I'm interviewing with you guys, and hopefully that I can earn your vote, and you can see that Fire and police, the only candidate endorsed by fire and police, which is very important, third safest city. I want to continue to grow to be the number one city, safest city in the state of Arizona. And I'm sure you all do too, because it brings economic development. CEOs don't want to move their business to an area that's going to be you know, high crime. CEOs don't want to move into a high crime area. So it's very important that we support the men and women, fire and police. We need to support them. And again, that all revolves around economic development. So I want to thank the FOP and the Arizona Fraternal Order of Police and Fire for endorsing me. And I hope that I can earn your vote. Rich Fidiello, Maricopa City Council. Thank you, God bless you, and I love you all. Thank you. Ms. Richard. Uh, as you all know, I'm Paige Ritchie. I'm 20 years old and um, this is so new to me. I've never been a public speaker. I've never really done anything where I go out and I am trying something like this. But more than anything, all I've ever wanted to do my whole life is help people. In all of my careers, in everything, in my education, and everything I've ever wanted to do is help people. And Maricopa has done nothing but guide me in the right direction to get there and help people. And all, that's all I want to do is help Maricopa and be Maricopa and get everything. I'm being a bit repetitive, sorry. Um, I just want Maricopa to thrive as it's helped me too. I want to help the development and growth and inspire Maricopa to be everything that I wished it could be when I first moved here. When I moved here eight years ago, I was in junior high going, why don't we have a mall? <laughs> but all I've ever wanted ever as I've grown and learned to love this community is for to give back to give back to allowing me to live here and allowing my family to thrive and become as to become our home really and I'm here to stay and I'm whether or not I'm elected I'd love to be elected but I want to inspire young people to know that we do have a voice I want to represent this community I want to help us grow and I want Everyone to know that as a young person, I'm here, and you guys can be too. Mr. Caroselli. Vision, collaboration, implementation. As I stated at the Rotary debate, people are very precious to me. I respectfully ask each of you to review my platform your city, your voice, Caracelli for citycouncil.com. You will find an all-inclusive platform that's realistic. I ask you to review it, and I ask you once again to take a long look in the mirror. As Michael Jackson says, you gotta look, start with the man in the mirror. You're looking for a candidate that's going to represent you, who aligns with your values, your morals, and what you want for the city of Maricopa. This is not a popularity contest. This is about who you feel truly represents you and who is going to move our city forward. 
I am Lynette Caraselli, and I am that candidate. Your city, your voice, August 28th, Lynette Caraselli. Thank you. Mr. Wade. Good evening, and I see that we're thinning out. And, um, you know, again, I want to thank you so much for spending your time here. Like, like Vince, it's been a long day. Been here since about 6, 6 o'clock this morning to be prepared. Um, when you look around and you think about the things that you want done in your city, I would like for you to take a look and see if I happen to be standing there with you. Because I know I'm involved in a lot of different organizations and I could list them and go through them and what have you, but I think you already know. At our last forum, I asked a question. Show of hands, how many people have I had at least a five minute conversation with? Show of hands. That means we're doing something right. We're engaged, we're participating, we're contributing. We're doing the things that need to be done in order for the city to help our, do our part to help the city grow. I like working with the people that I'm working with on council. We operate as a team. That's what we want. I like to not say I as much as I like to say we. We operate as a team. We, we have taken this city from a type of place where animosity and anger was running kind of rampant. And we have demonstrated through adult leadership that we can work together as a team. And we're doing that. And so when you consider myself and, and Vincent Manfredi as incumbents and you decide perhaps you want to keep us, think about who you want to add to that. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go past it. Just one second. Just one second. I apologize for going past it, but I have to do this because this is very important. Well, I guess I'm not going to be able to do it. All right, Mr. Wade, your time's up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, te technology sometimes is a, is a bear. The, the final thing I was going to say is I pledge an oath. I pledge an oath four times in the United States military before I retired, four times to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I pledge that same oath to you, Maricopa, when I came on board four years ago, and I'll continue to maintain that same oath to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. The decision is now yours. Thank you.